Lord, we do commit this time again to you. We, uh, we pray for all in the, our body that may be suffering with some ailment, physical or emotional, that you would touch them right now, God, by your spirit, that they would sense your presence here, that they would sense your healing, that they would know you are a God that hears our prayers, hears our cries and answers. So God, reveal yourself through the word, but also just touch each one in a special way. We pray, Lord, in your name. Amen. So, the reason I called this series Vacation in the Sun is because that's what it was supposed to take for the children of Israel to get from Egypt to Canaan. 11 days. The average vacation time <laughs> is between 10 and 14 in North America. And we've seen last week how Moses had a call, but he was human. <laughs> he failed because he took, he took some, uh, I don't think he was evil. Maybe some people thought he was evil. I didn't think he was that evil. I think he just made a, a mistake. He thought they would understand. So when he killed that Egyptian, he thought he was doing them a huge favor. But it didn't work out that way, did it? He, he had his, probably had his ego and security tested and he went running to protect his own skin. And what came to me is this, when we look in the mirror, when we think about our life and we think about the calling of God, because the Bible tells us each one of us has a call. When we think about that, now let's back up and go, who's my worst critic? <laughs> what keeps me from doing what I'm called to do? And if we're honest, I think the answer is kind of obvious. Who is my worst critic? Me. <laughs> I stand in the mirror and I go, hey, think back, you failed. Think back over there, that didn't work out the way you thought it was. You, and that wasn't, and I'm not talking about living in sin and turning around and following God. I'm talking about a believer that's committed to God, but they're scared. They don't want to step out because, well, I, I actually can remember what happened 15 years ago still. <laughs> I can remember what happened last week when I stood up. So Moses was failed, or Moses failed. But you know what's interesting about this and what I love is because it applies to us today is this. Moses couldn't shake his longing for God. You notice that? Even though he ran, he, never, he didn't renounce God. He failed. He felt insecure. He felt defeated, but he didn't renounce God. He passively still wanted God. And we're going to see how that plays out. And we're going to see that it is God who raises the leader. We seen last week, and we have, I have passages to back it, saying Moses was trained in all the wisdom. He was powerful in speech and deed. That's what it said. And you know what? Nothing's changed today. If you want to be an effective leader, you know what? The guys I work for are always taking courses. How to be a better leader. How to be more effective at managing people. They're taking seminars. They're reading books. They're studying guys like Winston Churchill, Martin King Jr., Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, to name a few. And they're trying to glean and do all this stuff But who is by far the best leader that we should be probably following? And that would be Jesus. And he had some characteristics that we can see. He was the greatest leader that ever walked the earth. Why? 
Well, one thing is he never let his ego get in the way. He didn't let pride motivate his decisions. He wasn't selfish. He was a man of great humility, being selfless. He didn't desire accolades, position or power. He was single-minded in pointing people to the truth, setting them free from bondage and helping them to know the Father. He was a servant leader. And we get all kinds of images in our head when we hear that, but humility, selflessness, servanthood, being approachable are all good qualities that make a great leader. And you know what we're going to see? We're going to take a look at Moses and we're going to see how God takes a supernatural person that's endowed with all kinds of... No. <laughs> we're going to see how God takes an ordinary person that failed and qualifies them to do extraordinary things. You know what? When Moses first hit the scene to be a leader, he was wearing Egypt's finest clothes. He had a fancy gold rings on, necklaces, probably a silk turban. He was well-spoken and educated at the world's best. He was raised in the king's palace. We, we sometimes forget. He didn't stay in that little floaty boat that his mom made. He was raised in the palace. He was raised to be a leader. Or actually, I thought a better way of saying it. He was raised to not be questioned. Think about it. He wasn't raised as a servant. He was raised as a leader. He was raised from a perspective of, you don't question what I say, you do what I say. He was raised to be an authoritarian, self-reliant and educated. He had, he had a lot of reasons to be pretty self-confident, quite honestly. This is where it turns a little more sad for us. <laughs> God had a different set of values for a godly leader. <laughs> Moses did not lack confidence in Egypt, but he did lack wisdom. Acts 7.22 says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. We see Moses as an authoritarian, superior attitude, and it ended badly. Him running for his life. Now we pick up the story again. Now years later, Moses is what? He's a shepherd herder. He has calluses on his hands from hard physical labor. He has had 40 years in the desert to think. And this is where you might struggle a little bit, but I think this is also where he communed with God. This is where all the questions probably came up over and over again. As he worked, all the things that came to his mind would have been, I was just doing what I thought was right. But what happens sometimes is we need to have a well, it says iron sharpens iron. We need the rough edge shaped, shaved off. In Exodus, after having a face-to-face -face encounter with God, we read Moses say, this is a direct quote. And this is where people that don't believe in God say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. This is 40 years later. Moses saying, pardon your servant, this is Exodus 4.10, by the way. Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow to speech and tongue. Wow. <laughs> He's changed a lot. 
What has changed in Moses' life? That he acts different, talks different, and sees life different. And I read a quote that I thought was interesting. A.W. Tozer said, it is doubtful whether God can bless any man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And if you think about it, you go, what does Hebrews say? We have a high priest that is not unable to empathize with us in our weakness. Jesus was hurt deeply too because he wanted to be able to relate to each one of our situations. You know what? We want our grand abilities and keen insights to make us usable to God, not our broken hearts and our cripple, crippling weakness. That's why I think it's kind of funny sometimes when, they, when I was in Bible school, they used to say, like a, someone that goes to Bible school for one year is dangerous <laughs> because they got enough enough education to be uh, to be hurtful. <laughs> all the doctorates, all the PhDs, and academic credentials will never compete with a heart refined by God's call and his hand. And Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes each one he accepts as a child. He's raising a leader in Moses and he's directing him and it's painful. And then I thought something that I think will blow your mind. Numbers 12, 3 says, after 40 years in the wilderness, let's play it out a little different. How about 40 years of meaninglessness? I've been faithful to you, God. I've been doing this lousy job I hate for 40 years. It's so meaningless. I don't get any satisfaction out of it. What was the byproduct? Don't forget, Moses did not renounce God. In his heart, he quietly sought after God. Numbers 12, 3. Now Moses was a very humble man, humbler than anyone else on the face of the earth. <laughs> you got a choice. You either become bitter or better. A friend of mine met me after I had gone through the worst dung pile of my life. And he looked at me and he said, you're a lot softer person now. And I really sat down and thought about it and I thought, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I think exactly the same. But something must have changed when you go through hard times and you have a choice to follow God even when it doesn't add up. Even when everything in your basket looks like it's rotten and you go like, what? That's what God was doing with Moses, and Moses handled it right. He allowed the pruning. He allowed the breaking. Moses always had a heart towards God, even in his failures. In his brokenness, in his confusion, in his questions, he is still found seeking God. His, his choices actually clearly show us his heart. He ends up at the priest of Midian's house where he marries the priest's daughter, Zephora. Do you know what Zephora means? This is quite interesting. This shows Moses is still human. Anyone? Okay, I'll answer. I get a prize for this though. <laughs> Zephora literally means beauty. He was hot, so he's human. He didn't go for the ugly one. He said, I'll take that one. So he was humble, but he still was, he wasn't blind. <laughs> Moses, during this whole time, don't forget, we're reading everything. But at that time, in that place, Moses had no reason to believe 
there was any grand plan. But yet he still had a heart for God. He hooks up with a priest. He hooks up with that guy's daughter. He settled into the groove. He had a wife, a job, a few kids. Things weren't that bad. He's thinking about the future now, a new future. You know, putting a few sheep away for a rainy day. Gathering his rainy day fund and retirement affairs in order. No different than us. Friday nights may have been a good night to load up the kids and his hot wife on the camel and take a ride through town. You know, see the sights. Hey. But you know what? There are few problems with trying to live like everyone else around you when you have a call of God in your life. Everything, no matter how good, feels empty. When you have a heart for God, building an empire seems worthless. This is why we find Moses in Exodus 3.1. He's working his shift. He's tending the sheep, taking care of Jethro's flock. As he is tending the sheep, he wanders with the flock to the far side of the wilderness where he came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. It was called that not because Christians named it that. It was because they were grand. They were known as the mountains of the gods. What's he doing? He's got a little fire inside his heart still, and he can't shake it. So he wanders to where I might just have a visit with God. You know what? Moses isn't the loud, boisterous talker anymore. He's not the life of the party anymore. He is all alone here. He's unsettled in his heart and maybe wondering what could have been. He is now looking more for God than favor with man. Think about it. He thought before they will see. Now he's going, I just want to seek God. And some Christians can relate to Moses' failure. And that's where it ends, unfortunately. And they walk around and wear their failure like it's a badge. Moses wasn't trying to prove himself right. Everything I can see points to a man bent on finding the presence of God, seeking the presence of God. Moses made mistakes, but not with evil intent. It was out of ignorance, maybe being naive. From an undiscerning mind, but what I love is this, God did not cut him loose, even for a second, because God seen his heart. And John 3, or I mean John 6, 37, part, the second part says, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. How many times have you felt like, I can't be used by God? But that's not scriptural, so we know where it comes from. This is Jesus talking, and he says, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. We gotta face it. Moses had come to terms with the thought he had failed, that he had given his best, but it just 
wasn't good enough. And I think there's many in the church that have those same feelings, struggling with feelings of having missed it. Feeling like Moses, the ship sailed and I will have to learn to live with what is left. God has more in store for each one of us than way we may be thinking. The fire, the life, the substance of the truth of Christ has for us cannot be quenched by circumstance. It cannot be brought down or stifled. You know what? When we meet the presence of God, nothing, nothing will stop it. And I started thinking, Paul and Silas were either drunker than you can get and still walk, but they weren't. Because it says at midnight, in Acts 16, 25 and 26, they're singing songs at midnight after being flogged. <laughs> I don't think they took the course on having a positive attitude and that's why they were doing it. This is what the presence of God in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through you does. They had an encounter with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That's what changes us. Not programs, not rules, not religion. Moses was called, but he was not equipped. And God never sends us into battle without equipping us first. I thought, well, being a good parent, would I send my kids to go play outside in the snow with their shorts and sandals? Come on, you guys, it's beautiful out there. Go build some snowmen. Come on, head out. No, you first put on a big snowsuit. You put on a tube, some nice warm mitts. And then if you're a smart parent, you stay inside and watch them through the window. Hey, you're doing good. That's awesome. That looks great. <laughs> Brains will come in a few years when you know that we stay on the inside and the rabbits stay on the outside. No, we put on stuff to protect them and God equips us to protect us or else you will never find yourself singing at midnight after you've just been flogged. I guarantee it. That comes supernaturally. That's not natural. Exodus 3.2 Moses is standing at the mountain of God. Back up. He hasn't renounced God. He has not quit believing. He is quietly seeking. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Verse four. You'll notice Moses is a different man now. He's not quick to act. Verse four says, he was intrigued. I'd be intrigued too. <laughs> he was intrigued and went over to investigate. Something to notice is, you'll notice he didn't turn and run. Something's changed. He didn't turn and run. This isn't normal. Is it normal for you to walk out and see a burning bush that doesn't burn up? No, it ain't normal. I would have probably turned and run. He didn't. After 40 years in the wilderness, at 80 years old, he is no longer rattled easily. The bush is burning, but not burning up. Instead of running away, he moves in for a closer look. 
As Moses moves closer to the fire, he hears God say, Moses, Moses. And Moses teaches us a very important three words. And you're going to see this over and over in the Bible. Anyone know what they are? Here I am. God, here I am. Just me. It's only me. I ain't got nothing left to give you. It's just me. Moses is 80 years old. He has lived a lifetime to get here, to get where he is. I want to hear God. I want to know God. And a hymn that I thought shows this quite well is, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me to come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. That was written by Charlotte Elliott, the writer of the famous hymn, Just As I Am, Without One Plea. Though weak and feeble in body, she was a giant in the things of God. You're getting the theme here, aren't you? <laughs> no one rides for free. Anyone God uses normally will first be hurt deeply. Verse five, Moses, stop. You are in my presence. Take off your shoes. I'm not gonna lie, that really used to mess with my head. I was like, what, <laughs> what? Take off your shoes, okay. I don't wanna smell your feet, but whatever. But as I thought about it, your old way of thinking is going to have to leave. You are gonna to have to put on my righteousness. You are standing on holy ground and I want your feet to be sanctified. Because where I am sending you, you will need to know that you are standing on solid ground. That you have a sure footing. And God says, I have seen the oppression and misery of my children. I have heard them cry out and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come to rescue them and bring them to a place of blessing and rest. Verse 10. So now go, I, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. This time, God was sending him. The last time, what does it say? He thought to himself. <laughs> There's some key wisdom there to get, <laughs> to pack it in the back pocket. I feel, I thought, are not good premises to start from. God is calling. Go with the blueprint of God, not your feelings. Verse 11, Moses says, who am I? You don't see him jumping up and volunteering, do you? Who am I? I am a defeated man. I am just a shepherd. Verse 12, God says, I will be with you. And I thought, you know what, for us, we have a blueprint. We have a lot of direction and instruction of what to do. But I think we have to ask ourselves this when we do anything. Be sure you know God can endorse your efforts. 
is what I'm doing God honoring? And verse 14, Moses says, hmm, past experience tells me this is a bad idea, God. <laughs> I've had 40 years to think about this. Don't forget. Who am I to tell? What am I going to tell them? Who am I going to tell them sent me even? Like, look at me. I'm wearing sheepskin from like 2001. This is so out of date. They're not going to respect me. You'll notice Moses is not wanting to go on his own efforts, his own endorsement. Moses has learned that he won't make it on his own. God says, let them know that I am has sent you to them. Moses has learned some valuable lessons in the wilderness, some serious character building lessons. And this is where I think it's awesome. When you go with the endorsement of God, what if the outcome is the same? It's a failure. <laughs> There's a big difference. If you go with your endorsement, you're the one that should, takes the brunt of the hit. If I fail, I truly have failed. But if I am commissioned by God, every situation is more likely to be like, what's your plan in this, God? You notice it's no longer your ego, your character, your abilities. It's God's plan and his problem. <laughs> it is no longer about me and my efforts. Moses had learnt Psalms 127, 1 to 5, unless the Lord builds the house, he who labors, labors in vain. Verse 16, God says, I'll tell you where to go, who to see, and how it's going to play out. Think about that. God says, I'm going to tell you who to go talk to, I'm going to tell you how it's going to play out. So I want you to know in advance. God is giving Moses information that is going to build his faith and confidence to trust God. Verse 17, God promises to bring the children of Israel out of bondage. God is the originator, source, and power of any work we will ever do in the spiritual realm. And you know what Moses is learning? If God says it, it will happen. You cannot replace, replicate, or artificially manufacture the power of God to sustain a person in his or her calling. Without God's power, we will fail miserably. When God equips, empowers his soldiers, nothing will stop them. And Romans 8, 38 and 39 say, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then if you look in Acts 17, 6, it says, these Christians are turning the world upside down. There's a big difference when you go in your own strength, your own power, your own intellect. A failure is a failure then. But when you go in the power and the anointing and the calling of Jesus Christ, you can stand there like Stephen and say, God, forgive him as they kill him. Revelation says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not shrink back from death. You know what? When you're positioned in the right place, all of a sudden you realize, I'm not the one this is about. <laughs> so it no longer is personal because I'm covered with the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ.
You know what? You are unstoppable when you're full of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be filled with the Spirit. And what it's really saying is keep being filled with the Spirit. Because as you're a leader, and all of us are leaders in one sense or another, people are watching. People are actually probably being sent by the enemy to try to derail you. And if you're full of the Spirit, but keep being filled with the Spirit, let it pour out. Let it pour out. Drizzle the Holy Spirit on them. If you have failed in the past, this is where I'm going to get very into the Old Testament Greek. Or no, that would be Hebrew, I guess. Okay, maybe then we're going to go New Testament. Or maybe I just made this up. Oh yeah, that was it. If you have failed in the past, don't sweat it. If you have doubted your call, don't sweat it. If you have run away and hid, don't sweat it. If you have been slow to understand's call, don't. Man, you guys are slow. Don't sweat it. <laughs> are you that person that has found themselves wanting more, lingering at the doorway to God's mountain? You are going to hear him, you are going to experience him, and you are going to feel him. As his presence becomes more real, it is going to change you. You are going to find out that there is a boldness rising in your spirit to proclaim truth. You know what? You're not going to be able to stop yourself from sharing the love of Christ. It is going to begin to flow out of you like a fresh spring brook. There will be no feelings of, I think I should. Because it will be an overflow of the love of Christ in you. You won't be able to contain it. Take comfort and encouragement from Moses, who did not get all of it right. But because God seen a desire in his heart to follow after him, he took Moses by the hand and led him to a place of understanding, power, and usefulness in servanthood. God met with Moses and used him greatly. Don't forget when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with him? Anyone, 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 any, any, anyone? Moses and Elijah, by the way. Think about it. Moses. I failed 40 years in the wilderness with a, almost a, an embarrassed sense of, I want to see God. And God said, buddy, when I show up, you're going to become a different man. And Moses was known as the most humble man on the face of the earth. He was known as a friend of God someone you speak face to face with. That's what happened from a failure. God is here to meet with each one of us, no matter our past failed attempts. He is up to something good right now. Don't fight the change. <laughs> So Lord, faithful Father, we humbly submit all the broken pieces. And we say, God, mold us, make us, fill us. So that when we do walk forward, we're walking in your power and strength and not in our own ingenuity, our own thinking, but in the power of the Holy Spirit where we're going to see your hand move mightily. So God, just anoint each person here. 
give each person here a touch from you. Give us the peace of Christ. Enjoy the Holy Spirit. And may our words bring healing and life to the people we come in contact with. In your name we pray. Amen.